SpaceX booster landings are awesome to watch. During landings, we're able to witness a massive cylinder gracefully land on an extremely precise landing site. Over the years, you may have noticed that SpaceX often lands their boosters on a drone ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. While this makes the entire process look even cooler, why in the world would they actually do this? Well, starting off, landing in the middle of the ocean is no doubt inconvenient. After all, you have to log back a massive booster hundreds of miles just to get it back to the coast. If SpaceX simply landed all of their boosters back at the launch site like they sometimes do, I bet they could save millions every year on transport costs. Moreover, the ocean surface isn't nearly as stable as land, thus making it much more likely that the booster will encounter problems during landing. Despite all of this though, SpaceX continues to land their boosters in the ocean. Now, safety concerns for people down below does play a role in this decision. But the choice actually has less to do with cost, convenience, and safety, and more to do with physics. Here's the thing, getting a payload into orbit has little to do with upward velocity. The key to achieving orbit is actually horizontal velocity. The boundary for space, which is marked by the Kármán line, is only 100 kilometers in altitude. So, there's really no reason for a Falcon 9 to be traveling at over 30,000 km per hour if reaching 100 km in altitude was all that was necessary. The high speed is there to ensure that the rocket ship actually stays in space. A popular misconception is that there is no gravity once you reach space, and that this is the reason that astronauts experience weightlessness. But this is completely false. Just think about it. We all know that tides are caused by both the sun and the moon's gravitational forces acting on bodies of water on Earth. Now, the sun is absolutely massive, and you can fit roughly 1 million Earths inside the sun. As a result, the sun's gravity is 27.9 times that of the Earth. So, it makes sense that the sun affects tides on the Earth. But what about the moon? The moon is only a quarter of the size of the Earth, and its gravitational force is only one-sixth of the Earth. On top of this, the moon is 384,400 kilometers away from the Earth, or 30 Earths away. So, if the moon is able to affect tides on the Earth, you would think that Earth's gravitational force would affect a rocket ship that's only a few hundred kilometers in space. And it does. In fact, the gravitational force of Earth in low Earth orbit is almost the same as the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth. But then, why do astronauts experience weightlessness? Well, this can be explained by perpetual falling. You see, astronauts aren't actually floating in space. They're actually continuously falling at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Imagine skydiving from an airplane for instance. If there was no atmosphere, you wouldn't feel the air molecules colliding with your body at high speeds. In other words, there would be no drag force. In such a scenario, skydiving wouldn't feel like falling. It would actually feel like floating. As we all know, there is no atmosphere in space. Thus, when astronauts are constantly falling towards the Earth, it feels and looks like they're floating. This brings up another concern though. If astronauts are just constantly falling towards the surface of the Earth, wouldn't they eventually reach the surface? Well, this is where their massive horizontal velocity comes into play. As we just discussed, once rockets cut through the atmosphere, they travel horizontally, not vertically. Now, think about how you would draw a big circle around a smaller circle. You draw a line at a constant speed that is slowly curving towards the center of the smaller circle. At any point, the direction of the pencil's tip is parallel to the surface of the smaller circle. However, the change in direction between any two points is directly towards the center of the circle. This is the same principle that orbiting rockets or satellites use. The rocket is simply traveling horizontally at a constant speed. The gravitational force, however, causes the trajectory of the rocket to bend towards the surface of the Earth and create a circle. Hopefully, all of that made sense. But what does all of this even have to do with landing in the ocean? Well, when the booster separates from the rocket, the rocket is traveling at about 7,800 km per hour. And this is almost fully horizontal velocity. So, for the booster to return to the launch site, it would have to cancel out all the horizontal velocity in the positive x direction and start traveling in the negative x direction. As we slow down and change directions though, we have a major problem. The only reason rockets are able to orbit the Earth without falling to the surface is because they are traveling so fast in the positive x direction. 
when you start to slow down, you're going to start losing altitude very fast. Thus, the rocket booster will not only have to use its engines to change direction, but it'll also have to work on maintaining altitude so that it doesn't fall and explode. Considering this, it's going to take significantly more fuel for a rocket to actually return to its launch site, which would of course cost a lot of money. But that's not it though. This is really not a matter of cost. You're actually facing a much larger physics problem once again. Whenever you add fuel to a rocket, you need to make the fuel tank and the rocket itself bigger. However, making the rocket bigger and adding fuel to a rocket adds mass to the rocket. As a result, you'll have to add even more fuel and fuel capacity to allow the rocket to carry the original fuel you added. In the case of returning to the launch site, the math doesn't really work out that well. In many cases, you'll end up infinitely adding more fuel and fuel capacity to power the previous fuel and fuel capacity you added. But wait, planes are able to take off from an airport, circle for hours, and then just land at the airport again, no problem. How is that possible then? Well, planes only travel within the Earth's atmosphere, so they're able to take advantage of air resistance or drag. In fact, if an airplane were to run out of fuel, it can fly for another 70 miles before crashing or hopefully landing on the surface. The drag force is slowing down the airplane the entire time, but it is also preventing the plane from just falling out of the sky. With rocket boosters on the other hand, they generally separate at about 70 to 80 kilometers in altitude. And at that height, the atmosphere is extremely thin. So the drag force is not going to help the booster very much in slowing down or maintaining altitude. Even after the booster falls back to thicker atmospheric levels though, the booster doesn't have really big wings designed to help it glide or anything like that. As a result, all the work has to be done by the rocket booster itself. Considering this, returning to the launch site is impossible because of the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. However, energy can be transferred out of a system. For example, when a rocket launches, it releases a lot of heat into the atmosphere. The rocket system loses energy as it heats its surroundings, but from a universal level, no energy was created nor destroyed. The energy is simply transferred from the rocket to the air molecules in the atmosphere. Before a rocket launches, it only has potential chemical energy, which is the fuel. As the rocket gains altitude though, the potential chemical energy is converted to kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and heat. Kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy are great because these are conservative, meaning that no energy is lost from the system. Heat or thermal energy, however, is not conservative, meaning that it can be lost from the system. Take a ball for example. If you throw a ball straight up in the air at 2 miles per hour, it'll return to your hand at 2 miles per hour as minimal energy will be transferred out of the system. If you throw the ball straight up at 20,000 miles per hour though, it might catch fire as it travels upwards and burn up in the air. In such a scenario, the ball won't return to your hand at all. No energy was created or destroyed in this scenario. However, all of the kinetic energy you give the ball was transferred to the atmosphere as thermal energy. As a result, for the ball to return to your hand safely, minimal energy can be converted to thermal energy during its flight. This same principle applies to the rocket booster. But as we all know, the only reason the booster is even flying in the first place is because of the burning of RP-1 or whatever fuel it's using. So it's impossible to launch a rocket without losing energy to the atmosphere. There are several equations you can use to calculate how much kinetic energy you have and how much is converted to thermal energy and all of that. I haven't done the math myself, but Elon Musk has said, quote, So in, in order to get back to the launch site, you would have to have enough uh, fuel and oxygen to reverse out that velocity and, and, and boost back all the way to the launch site. Um, and you just don't have, the physics of it don't really allow you to have that much. It's, it's not about saving money on fuel or anything. It's just physically impossible. So I'm just going to take his word for it. At the end of the day, SpaceX lands her boosters in the ocean because the booster is traveling at thousands of kilometers per hour horizontally, not vertically. Because of this and the law of conservation of energy, it's physically impossible to return to the launch site after launching a decent payload. No matter how powerful or efficient the engine is, it's just not going to happen. If you really, really want to land at the launch site for some reason though, there are a couple of solutions. One, you could just travel all the way around the Earth and come back and land at the same place. This is what the space shuttle did for decades. 
or you could feel the booster in space or somewhere during its flight. Lastly, you can choose to launch a very light payload, which SpaceX does sometimes do. As you can see though, these solutions aren't very meaningful when you're just trying to land a booster. And that's why SpaceX has resorted to landing in the middle of the ocean. Did you guys realize that bringing back a booster to the launch site was that complicated? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if this video helped you understand just a little bit more about the mechanics of rocket science. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.